Boss on Morning Express this Wednesday morning. Let's jump straight into the conversation as we react to issues as captured on the front pages of the newspapers on our newspaper review segment. I'm now joined by an economist and a political analyst, also a public affairs speaker as well. Good morning to you, Dr. Aliu Elias. Nice morning, to have you on the program. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Now, without further ado, it's coming at a time when the vice president, following the commissioning of uh, ICT hubs in Benue State, repledged President Bola Metinibu's commitments to SMEs, saying that 80% of Nigerians would, would be without a job but for the contributions of the SMEs. Now, he also seized the opportunity to speak about President Bola Metinibu's planned trip to china uh, let's begin with this comments about how critical smes are to the growth of nigeria and uh this dedication towards flagging uh ict hubs fashion hubs in different states under the current administrations that we're seeing is this approach to smes clinic what nigeria needs to somewhat breach the unemployment gap? well i am very very happy that uh, the vice president actually acknowledged the role of M msme in businesses you will recall that social government has actually created a lot of program for msme to to develop but what is the result that is the question so to really bring up msme there need to be strategy you know, it has to be strategic and it's not going to be one size fit all because i think that's the problem we are actually having someone in Bayesa who live in the riverine area is thinking of business in his local government it's different from someone who is in abuja Someone who is in the bad, even from someone who is in Kano. So we must start looking at this and create peculiarities per each region state, and each state. state and region. That's what we need to look at. And when we talk about MSME, I must tell you that no matter what they do, if the CBN interest are level <laughs> rate is still, is still at, at that level, MSME will not grow because most people that are doing businesses. Myself, I also a small business person. I will do business. We know what it takes us to raise our fund. We know what it takes us to pay taxes, you know. That's when we also see the, the, the new tax uh, regime that is about to come. We are saying, oh, this will be a good way if you can exclude some people, you know, from those uh, taxes. So for me, if he can, but from his background, he's a banker and he's, he, I think he studied, uh, he's an agri economist. So from his background, he, he will understand better what it simply means. I can tell you if MSM is, is doing well in Nigeria, 80% of our problem will be solved because about 75 percent of Nigerians are actually our workforce are actually in MSME but if you look at that MSME is being stifled so so much that if I, if you look at our last uh, release by uh, MBS they said Nigeria economic growth is a function of a uh, service sector you know that's a serious challenge you know it's no manufacturing sector it's not agri sector sector they said it's a uh, it's, uh, service sector is a challenge on our part then there are president you know, going to no, no, let's talk about right. this challenge before we talk right. about the president's trip right now what it does for our production economy right going to the projection of 3.1 percent that has now been accredited to the service sector you say it's a big challenge please help us expand the conversation right so what we're trying to say basically when you say service sector service sector simply means those jobs that are much more of portfolio you know maybe uh shares and all those things but when we talk about production sector you know agriculture is our main hub in nigeria not only in nigeria even in africa so if you are not doing agriculture it's a sign that there's a problem so we expect that by now agricultural sector should be leading the gdp of nigeria in terms of development because most people are there but the apology there is that they are subsistence farmers so they need to come up and maybe be strong in what they actually are doing and we must have comparative advantage you know what are we producing that we can you know maybe it's cassava you know we must be able to really add value to them because more like having net export exactly. value you know you know value chain is key at, at this point i can tell you i see exporting raw cocoa you know what we have discovered since 100 years up to now we are you know we're supposed to have had value to all this thing before we now export so the value chain also will bring businesses in and who are going to be in this value chain it is msme even the manufacturing sector the big company they are going to be serviced by the msm msme so that's the major uh, challenge that we must look at then when we talk about manufacturing sector if, if agricultural sector is not leading, we should have manufacturing sector leading. But you will see that most manufacturing sector are closing shop. The ones that are producing are saying they are having unsold. The international ones that are here are also leaving the country. So the Nigeria government must find a way to empower these people to, you know, to come up. When I've seen different loan targeting MSME. 
the fact is that it's not about the loan itself okay by the time i use the loan finish if i want to like get more uh, money where will i go these are the questions you know and by now we should have been scaling up if you look at the ex the level at which president Mohamed were expended on msme by now those msme must have scaled up you know you know when we talk about business we might have scaled up to how many of them have scaled most businesses after five years is they are out of business because they cannot survive the the climb the economic climb that we have in it so it's a great challenge that we need to look into critically for us to develop msme must develop now i'm talking about president bola made timibu's trip to china it's coming at a time when there is a lot of speculations about china's grievances towards nigeria with the reports of having seized storm jets and whatnot mm -hmm. now it's more from the angle of the fdis that uh the vp is envisioning that this trip would be able to attract into nigeria Help us get perspective into this. Right. If you look at China, China remains uh, the best hope for Africa for now, even though we still do uh, businesses with uh, America than China. But I think China is the second country we are dealing uh, with more. But the problem is that, you know, we must look at, that's why I say we must look at company. What are we giving? You know, what are they taking? You know, what are they, you know, what is technology they actually uh, bring? You know, China that we know, China is open to businesses in as much as uh, it will give them advantage. But you recall during President Mohamed Buhari, that was a what we call the Nera swap. We call it that Nigeria will now be buying items from China with yuan, with their currency. And at, at a point, that thing died uh, off. And that's a sign that there are some people still gag gagging us from doing business with all these uh, uh, Chinese companies. Because an average people from the East who does buying and selling, you know, right, always import majorly from the from China. So if you are importing from China and you are still importing with dollar. You know, you know, there's a way it is a contradiction. But what if we are able to import from China by using China uh, currency? That would have solved a lot of problems. And it will bring down the pressure on, on dollar demand in Asia and Africa. So that's what, one thing we need to do. Then on the forecast, you know, pres our president is the ECOWAS uh, uh, chairman. So there's going to be a regional meeting and it's going to have a, a discussion with the with China that relates to uh, West Africa. And if you look at West Africa, China is, remain, is becoming, in fact, the best uh, hub uh, for us. And it has to discuss regional issues that will benefit uh, uh, Nigerians. I think that then in terms of the uh, jet, the seizure of the uh, jet, you recall that that case is not a uh, national uh, case that much. It's just like that, that the uh, company actually wants to make sure that it gets uh, the right uh, I think it was between the uh, Ogun State government about uh, in terms of a uh, uh, free trade uh, zone, and according to them, they said they did not make use of it, and they now took them to to court. And it, before you know, they said they seize. Uh, I think they, there should be a diplomatic way of managing such uh, issues. So I think for him to have actually gone to uh, China, so that's an opportunity for him to manage that case because it's creating a serious embarrassment to our dear country. I can tell you. Can imagine. A Nigerian debt being seized because of you know a subnational uh, related uh, issue. It's a serious uh, issue. I think President should find a way, and I'm sure he's going with his team too. So those his team will be in charge to make sure that they actually do what they're supposed to do. Now, in moving to another concerning development in terms of Nigeria's projections for its economy in light of current data available, let's revisit the front page of the Guardian newspaper and particularly the infographics that has now ranked. The cost of production per barrel in certain oil producing countries across the globe. Now, on the front page of The Guardian this morning, we saw the infographics, as you can see, inserted to the right hand corner beneath the lead story that reads $48 per barrel production cost drowns 60% of Nigeria's oil earnings. Now, amongst the likes of Libya, Iraq, Angola, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, United States, Iran, Russia, China, Venezuela, and the UAE, Nigeria has the highest cost of producing a barrel. Now, you'd find inserted beneath that also a caption that reads, Nigeria's $10 per barrel production cost target is an aspiration undermined by insecurity, inefficiency, logistics, overhead costs, corruption, and regulatory challenges. It most of sums up some of these challenges, but I'd like to get an economic perspective owing to the fact that most of the projections we make for our budget and overall economic outlook for the year is hinged on what our oil production is said to be. Now, we're told that 60% of this production is, uh, our earnings are being threatened by this high production cost. Well, mostly we see that uh, trajectory. 
as uh, you know when we see government budgetary plan we see it as uh, maybe over ambitious sometimes because you know you look at the indices around now you see the challenges that uh, comes with it for me first and foremost you know there's what we call logistics and supply chain if you don't get your logistics very very well i can tell you let me give you a close example that will clear it for you to move a 40 feet container from the Tinkan Island to the city center, it may take you six hours. But well, for you to travel from here to London, it will take you the same six hours. Do you see the logistics are uh, problem? So we must make sure that anything around oil sector, we have been in this business for over 50 years, right? That we have discovered our oil that we have been trading in this area. Why up to now we've not seemed to get the logistics? quite right. Let me tell you first thing is that look at the insecurity in Ninja Delta. You know, it costs every company that is in that area to pay extra. Is that you pay personal security? You know, even government has to engage personal uh, security belongs to Tom Polo to actually secure because of, uh, you know, bunker and what have you. All these amounts to the cost of the production then another thing is the infrastructure you know there is no way if you don't have the enabling infrastructure that will make the activities in that area very enabling it's going to amount to the cost because if you're supposed to move an item between one day and it's costing you eight days it's part of it if you're supposed to you know bring out a particular uh, product within three hours it's costing you a whole day it's going to amount to the cost so when you're supposed to pay staff maybe for three hours, you are paying them for three days. You know, we are supposed to move an item. You know, even look at logistics of bringing for it. That was during this rainy season. Now, some tankers will tell you they cannot move because of bad road. You know, and it's causing queue. You know, these are the things that we need to look at. So, if we cannot tackle this corruption, you know, and corruption is another thing because you need to have a lot of bureaucratic bottlenecks. You need to get a lot of licenses, a lot of process. So, for you to now say per barrel, it has to be cost you at ten dollars because if you look at most companies around. It's hovering around 10 to $20. But our own is 48 And that would have reduced our end because what you're supposed to get, you have expended it on basic things that are supposed to be solved. So until we move around and solve the logistic problem around, reduce the corruption. And it, don't joke with all this uh, bunkery too. Bunkery, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, way of stealing our, our, our common patrimony, you know, it's also adding to it. So, and government is aware, that's my problem. So, when we talk about Meleki area and his team, I look at how are you making things easy for yourself in that, or perhaps maybe some people are enjoying from that bureaucratic uh, uh, bottleneck. You know, when there's difficulties, that's when some people make their own money. Well, these are some of the trajectories that uh, many say is not nice for the oil space in Nigeria in terms of our earnings, as particularly at a time when none of our refineries are working, but for the private refinery on that Dangote. And it's with the promise that, uh, September. Se uh, yes, September is around the corner, less than three days away. Right. Uh, you have high hopes that that promise of churning out PMS will be kept. Well, it, it, uh, Dangote is a private company that is, uh, that is profit uh, oriented. As a, as a private company, they'll find every means to make sure that they actually produce. And that's all part of why they are coming out to see a lot of things about why they're having difficulty. But look at uh, uh, Nigeria's own refinery, Potakot. Every time they promise us it will come up, it will come up. It has not come, but I can assure you, because it's a private run, and, and perhaps he has some obligation to actually run. In fact, I think there was a ranking yesterday that made Dangote the, the second richest and not the first again. So Dangote will want to find every means to make sure, you know, perhaps he, according to him, he borrows some money from banks, he has incurred some cost, he needs to pay salary of uh, his workers, so there's no way he will not want to come up. So I think with uh, uh, government by his side, because that's another thing, he can actually uh, come up to do his business. Now, in keeping with more stories greeting the frontline focus on the newspapers this morning, we'll turn our attention now to an issue of undemocratic calls for a change of government. Now, the Nation newspaper had earlier reported a pledge by the CDS and Chief of Army staff to support civil rule as the military has been urged to resist anti-democratic calls. Now, this uh, gained more momentum during the hashtag Ed Bad Governance protest. But listening to this calls from the CDS and Quas this morning as to how important it is for a democratically run government to be in place at a time where we have the Sahel states setting an unprecedented trajectory in the economic community of West African states. Let's get your thoughts on that. Right. I, I actually, during the end bad governance, I listened to uh, uh, General Lagwaja and I listened to him clearly say they are okay with their offices in Ibarra. That you don't have intention of coming up to, you know. But you recall that, you know, there's this narrative when they raise those flags 
during the end bad governance that flag is like it's more of in the military uh, flag as well and more of a russia flag but the only thing is the arrangement of the of the flag so i think it's, it's good for our democracy for our military men to say no we are not coming uh we are not looking at it's not even part of our agenda to topple or to see this government not working where they are okay i think that commitment is good but however you know the governance is what is much more key you know in as much as they are okay they are well treated they are well funded we also need better economy in Nigeria. so those that are as agitating for any bad governance they now said that october they are coming back again according to what they are actually saying that those 17 agenda if government see anything they can read because sometimes when you see this kind of protest complaint from the public it also informs the government of the earnings of the challenges of the need of the people in that environment so uh, i salute the cds and coas that what they are doing is good they are coming up and you know i must tell you that they are even overstretched and I, I can tell you even when they are in, when you are in military era i'm not sure military are more stressed <laughs> compared to this because there's trouble one way or the other if there is no chaos here there is a kidnapping you no know, and they are calling on on them and that's why some of us see the way the change of guard of uh, is it SS, SS and uh, NIE, you know, we look at it that's a positive omen. I think it's a right thing for them to come out, come out and be, declare that they are full support of the Mr. President and democracy. Now, it's also coming at a time when there's been an increased report of kidnapping across certain states in Nigeria. The Daily Times this morning, as we revisit the front page, mirrored in the security challenges in Kaduna State where it reports that residents have been forced to flee to urban centers following a rising abduction in the hinterlands, whilst the IGP has also issued a call to action as well. Now, let's revisit the front page of the said paper. Now, on the Daily Times this morning, you'd find insecurity Kaduna residents flee to urban centers as abductions rise in hinterlands. IGP urges citizens collaboration. Now, Kaduna has been a hot spot for some time now. It's had some colorations of religious, ethnic challenges as well. And in this time when residents are fleeing urban centers, we're having more IDPs. The IG has said it's more of a collaboration from the perspective of citizens. How does this help fix the challenges with security in Kaduna? I think beyond the Kaduna State, but it won't be fair if we are mentioning the Kaduna. If you look at uh, Yobi, if you look at uh, Midugu, you know the Midugu before, a place like Goza, the people go there and they do their life, but everybody have to flee down to Medigu town. But if you go to Medigu town, it's very, very, you know, very, very, in fact, if you look at Abuja now, the factors that happen in Thailand in those states is affecting Abuja because most people are now coming to the urban arsenal. But Kaduna case, you know, is a case that I don't know what to say about it because it has been reoccurring over time. You know, before it was it said that it's religion, before you know, according to every fight that time, you bring out, he uh, has a, uh, maybe a, a, an agency who look at the rate of death. You know, and the rate, rate of mayhem. And by the time the research comes up, I think it used to come up every month. Then, when he was governor, before you know, even the rate of, at which people died at the uh, southern Kaduna cannot be compared to the northern part of Kaduna because if you look at this, the kidnapping is much more in the north compared to the south. The south is said to be uh, maybe religion and uh, maybe uh, Maruda and what have you crisis. But the thing is, it's affecting the city so well because you know people will now flee from their ancestry home, from their farm, farm from the interland and come to the city because cities seem to be much more, uh, and I can tell you, city is more safe because it's well secure, you know, and those people will not come to the city because if they come to the city to do anything before they will escape down back, they will be, you know, apprehended. So I think that is the problem. And that's why we must make sure that these people in the farm, in the hinterland, so in the, in the north, the urbanization will be much than what we can actually compare. It's happening in Abuja. You know, before now, you, you hardly see, you know, it's not as the level of this level you see many people on the street they are from Mediguri, many are from yobe many are from kaduna because they believe that we need to go for safety and you know what's the responsibility of federal government or any government safety of what life and property so people don't feel safe it's ideal that you want to go to where you are actually safe so i think government need to do more to create much more security and that's why we're talking about beyond police if you notice even military is taking over the responsibility of nigeria police even the SS, dss the uh, you know a lot of them because we have lost intelligence 
because intelligence is what we actually need. If there is going to be a trouble, look at what happened uh, at Uzi uh, market. That shouldn't have happened if we have good intel. Because the intel would have said that these people are coming to do a procession or protest at Uzi market. The police would have planned well, you know, well to really, you know, secure. Now, police lost their life because it was uh, sudden that they invite them to come and, you know, uh, set to the, the police. So we need to do more of intel. To solve this uh, uh, insecurity problem in Nigeria. Now, this concept of community policing and the networks needed to ensure effective community policing have been somewhat a conversation for a long time. On the one hand, it's been treated from the angle of intelligence gathering, like you said, and information sharing. There's also been the need for community watch in terms of vigilantes or forest guards and a synergy between the police, which is saddled with keeping the peace and order in some of these hotspots much like you have analyzed. But is this synergy that seems to be lacking in some states? Most times, the kidnappers, when they strike, or bandits, in some cases, come in well-armed that even op overpower the police, as it were, that the army has to come in. Now, owing to the calls from the IGP, how do citizens collaborate effectively under these different networks, the intelligence gathering, the vigilante, the forest guards, or even a sample of the Omoteko like we have in the Southwest. Right. If you, if you really, if you look at it very well, I think the Omoteko is functioning very well. And it's like that okay, they also have a uh, vigilante. They actually, because you recall that when they uh, arrest, when they kidnap those people at Costa, Kogi State uh, University of uh, Science and Technology, you know, it was the, the vigilante that actually followed. Because, you know, if the, there's kidnapping and you don't follow them within 24 hours, they would have escaped and, you know, they have to follow them bumper to uh, to bumper. But uh, um, in a nutshell, I, I think it's important we go back to uh, state police, you know, even community police, state police, we may have to solve the problem. You know why? Because if there's any incidents, you know, the governor have to call the commissioner, the commissioner have to call the what? The IG, the IG have to give the approval. But imagine if the, if the command is within the community, where the local government chairman can actually call the head of security there that, okay, or, uh, swing to actions, but the bureaucratic bottleneck, the stages at which you command and control happens, it's bringing a serious uh, delay in security. So for me, I think it's good we consider that uh, state police. We are scared that maybe governor might hijack, hijack it. it, but it's not issue of governor might hijack. There's a stage, there's a way you can do it. That where there's a particular case, it comes to federal. Where there's a particular case, it remains in the state. And when federal government is interested in a particular case, they can take over that. Uh, that's case. We are still running the federation, you know. These are the things. But for me, I think the security must go down. You know why? If you go to any community and you see somebody, you know, I could recall even what happened at uh, Use. You know, I got an intel, um, a, an information from people that ah, in Zuba, everybody is looking for Use Moto. Use Moto is scarce. That shows that those people that are coming to protest have been mobilized. Have mobilized and they are entering commercial vehicle to come to we say market that's how community police actually work you know why by the time somebody came in around and you've not seen the face before he just called i've not seen this person be before and he's now in my environment so these are the how it's actually here because if you bring somebody from another state or another community it may be difficult for him to know who is who and that's why we said traditional ruler also must be involved in all this if a community uh dweller did not see uh, have not seen a particular person before you can reach out to the traditional ruler. traditional ruler will reach out to the security this is that we must all be interested in the issue if not kidnapping banditry will not go soon and that's why we said there must be community police and you can see amotekun amotekun most cases amotekun take charge of it before informing the, uh, the the police and it's very very key in fact if you go to most places in kogis you see vigilante everywhere in fact in abuja here in my own community, you see them manning the gates and doing sort of things, but they need to be integrated, sort of. So I think maybe through the Nigerian civil defense, they can integrate these people, train them. You know, they still have them gone, you know, compared to what the other people we actually bring. So I think we need to integrate and understand that the, the earlier we integrate and do a community policing, the better for Nigerians. Now, I'm still on issues of uh, insecurity. Now, Southwest communities were captured earlier by the Vanguard. We'll just have the Vanguard flashed on screen while we revisit the issues at hand. Now, this kidnapping epidemic, as we see in Nigeria, not particular to Kaduna, the North Central, or whatever regions in the country, 
but now away from some of the agitations for secessionism which has been linked to the IPOB and ESPN in the Southeast now has kidnapping on the rise in Southeast communities. The Vanguard reported a story about this earlier on. There's agony in the Southeast as kidnappers have laid siege in communities unhinged. And it's the challenge of how has it become a thriving business for many that are with the intel available and with some manifestations of conflict or unrest like you've said we still have more of a challenge in mobilizing our security architecture to combat this or even be able to rescue uh, kidnapped victims to some several days after i think it's because uh, most people are engaged in kidnapping are thriving and it doesn't cost them so much you know they just come kidnap people and ask for a big R and so and it's a failure on our intelligence because we must go back to the if there is a, a proper policing and proper intelligence would have captured these people look at what is happening in the head sector most doctors are on strike simply because one of them has been what a kidnapped alongside the family you know and they said there is no way we can do this let us just go uh uh, on strike, maybe government will see reason to increase the security. And I can tell you, this is affecting all facet of uh, Nigerians. I can tell you, no state that will not say they will not have share of what uh, kidnapping. It happens everywhere now, become a thriving business, uh, and simply because there is not enough intelligence, and there is, people are not bring, they are not bringing people to work. I recall that some state has passed the law that kidnapping will be uh, is a what we call it that anybody who commits kidnapping will be killed. You know, there's a state that gone through that level. I think federal government need to do more in terms of security. We just have to because the thing is falling on the military more than even the police. The police that we know, there must be police in every community, every local government. There must be DPU at every uh, level of government. But we are not seeing them being effective. And that's a serious problem. I can tell you most Nigerians are scared traveling alongside any road now. In fact, some people, they will just, you can see Kubu are very close in, in, in FCT. People, they will just come and kidnap those people. You can see what happens in the local government. But thanks to Wiki, even in FCT now, you could see that I think the rate has actually reduced. And we want other states also to take queue into that. You know, mobilize your police, support. You know, you must not wait for, for federal government to always support the police. I could see Kogi state governor who bought vehicle, or other state governors who bought vehicle for that. You need to empower Nigerian police. You need to support them to reduce this kidnapping. And then for the case of the uh, East, you know, East has been uh, in challenges, uh, such as insecurity. You know, we have unknown uh, gunmen that will just come to the streets, do what they want to do, and go. We have the issue of IPOB. You know, we have the issue of uh, XPN. You know, a lot of things there. But the thing is, the Eastern people must realize that it is their community. They must find a way to tame these people. You know, there's always uh, is it uh, sit at home every Monday. Monday. There must be a way. I recall the governor of Enugu State is trying to really fight that hard. But how about other governors? I think the, the people in the East, the leaders, the political leaders, the traditional leaders, even the youth must come together and agree that any people who perpetrate such evil will be dealt with. If they don't do that, it will consume the community. And that will be a disaster for Nigeria. Now, we're hoping to avert that disaster by increased community policing and more concerted efforts on the part of the Southeastern Governors Forum. Now, in keeping with other developments, we also looked at the lead story on the first newspaper earlier, where the hashtag End Bad Governance protest organizers have issued a 17-point ultimatum to the federal government ahead of the October showdown, where they are threatening to resume processions across major cities in Nigeria should the ultimatums not be met. And uh, quite concerning are some ultimatums that persons consider non-achievable, one of which is the call for an increase of the current minimum wage to be reviewed to 250,000 Naira. They're also calling for the release of Namdi Kanu and the scrapping of the 1999 constitution. Now, many had talked about the sponsorship of this protest not necessarily being about the issues that should be addressed. I saw reactions to this from some of the persons who joined our live stream that uh, the protest seems to be losing the focus of getting the nation to work by fixing refineries and whatnot. Some of this demands as listed on the first newspaper. In your perspective, does it keep with the hunger protest that it started out as before now metamorphosing into hashtag end bad governance protest? Well, I, I was thinking, you know, if you recall the Kenya uh, scenario, Kenya scenario was on issue of finance you know, financial bill. 
and they stay put to that they make sure they achieve that and government actually came out and withdraw that uh, policy i think that's what i expect from this bad uh, governance however i was thinking they will also stay put to one or two in which one of them should be released of uh, people that have been arrested because according to semi falano it's about 2,000 and bad governance protesters and police uh, custody. So I think that's what they should fight for first. But for the issue of constitution, we all know that constitution review, we, we have seen patriots led by, is it, uh, is it uh, Emeka Nyoku, right? That led by him that said the, there is need for a constitution. I think it's a general agitation. And it should not come from them. It should come from the totality of Nigeria. Perhaps they all have represent we all have representative in national assembly and i'm sure benjamin kalu is also doing the review of the uh, constitution so for me i think they should not ask for what is uh, not a uh, um how do i call it achievable uh for them i think they should stay put on the issue of end bad uh governor you know end bad governance is encompassing you know it has to do with uh, poverty reduction it has to be to be with uh, to do with uh, fixing of uh, referendum but coming out and said the sal uh, salary minimum must be 250 at what rate you know the expect government to actually uh, pay that. You recall yesterday it was shown, uh, it was researched by budget that said uh, government is expending uh, more than uh, the revenue itself. So I think we have seen this and I, I don't think, and government has actually do well by approving uh, 70,000. We need to see it even working first because it's not, uh, you know, they have not started paying that folk ask for all that. So I think any bad governance team should ask for what is realistic at uh, 17 is too uh, large in number to ask for if it's three four stay put and make sure you achieve it because sometimes wouldn't stop uh, such uh, protest or such people coming out to say because it's also an informative uh, uh, way information way for the uh, federal government to also see people's concern what people are yearning for, what they should attend. Because I can tell you, the animal governance has actually shaped some things. So they need to just take it with caution and make sure they ask for what is within uh, what can be achieved in the short period. Perhaps they can even say this 250 we expect. You know, government has also said every two years they will review. And then that's every three years. Every three years that they will have to uh, review. That's a good one. So if we, they have given us, uh, given workers, so to say, 70,000 naira, and maybe next three years they have reason to review, it, it would have been a good one. So I think they should, there should be time length to their demand, if I thought they have such a large demand. Now, the challenge is there's also the ultimatum timeline. October 1st has been another date put down by the protesters that they would look to resume street processions. And we looked at some of the negative impacts of the uh, most recent and bad governance protest on the economy. Uh, do you think at this point that the government needs to begin to look to invite this uh, set of protesters who are issuing some of these ultimatums to a round table? I think this and uh, uh, bad governance protests are being considered, if you ask me, because for it to give time to what the protest, you know, all the other protests that we have is just naturally it will start springing on before you know it consume uh, a community. But I think if they are giving uh, dates to it, that means they, they are giving room for government to adjust. You know to do some things to engage them that this is possible this is not possible i think it's a good opportunity for government to actually do something you will recall that even the last one there was about a month a uh, notification that there will be a uh, protest and government have the opportunity of saying go to the opportunity of going to court and say no we confine you to the national stadium in abuja for lagos ganifa Emido, and a lot of places take action i think it's give government opportunity to pro to actually prepare unlike the Procession that we have from uh, MI is MIN that it just starts, you know, at a time where you wouldn't be able to, you know, you won't get yourself to actually prepare for it. So, for them to give timeline to you, I think it's opportunity for government to engage uh, their leaders the more and see how they can actually come to a round table. Now, away from these projections of an October showdown between the organizers of the hashtag and bad governance protests, come the first day of October, are some of the demands in a 17 point ultimatum issued which are considered to be non-realistic according to dr aliu elias now in keeping with more reviews this morning there is a health advisory following the outbreak of mpox that has now been recorded in 19 states in nigeria now 40 cases have been reported and lagos has issued a new alert following a new variant of the mpox virus but uh, there's been some respite and hope as 10,000 vaccine doses has been donated to Nigeria by the U.S. 
Now, the challenge with fighting some of these diseases that are endemic to Africa has been based on the availability of vaccines. On the other hand, it is also based on some of the hygiene situations. We have contact tracing challenges within Nigeria. And even at the board point of entry into the country, our security in terms of health challenges that are supposed to be flagged by the first contacts at our borders. Uh, let's get your perspective on this. Right. I think uh, uh, what would I call it, Mpox, is as old for, it's old, is over centuries. And it's not Nigerian, it's not Africa. It's a global uh, problem. And has come uh, of age, you know, it starts from small paws, from small paws to monkey paws, from monkey paws now it is called Mpox, maybe because of the animal right or what have you. So, but, but, but the, the fact just means that we are not preparing enough. I, but I should commend the is it CDC? Yes. Yeah, this is a, a control. They are doing actually well. But it's beyond them. They are in the federal. You know, right? Every state also have to have a way of monitoring all these uh, uh, cases. I think it's case that we can manage, but we need to just be pro, much more proactive about it. For me, I'm not. I'm not thinking it's a quick. A solution to get uh, people vaccinated because you know some of these of some of these uh, vaccines sometimes we have to have a cautious optimism uh, sometimes because they said the impulse is even with different variants so sometimes you need to take time to study it not consume uh, the uh, vaccine at a time but what we need to do is, is to be more vigilant and to have people well trained to monitor and make sure that those people that have it are isolated. I will recall that in Ebola, Nigeria try, try a whole lot that make sure that Ebola was done. And this is not new. You remember, this impulse is not actually new globally compared to Ebola, compared to COVID-19. Uh, COVID so what I just think is that our health workers need to be trained more on, on traces, contract traces, to trace people that actually have it and make sure that they secure uh, other people from contracting such uh, such ailments. But for me, I think Nigeria is still doing it. But so we have a, a minister of health and uh, social welfare who is well experienced in terms of uh, such uh, diseases. You know, you recall that he was, he was supposed to be, be Gavi. And Gavi is one of the most... Uh, Leading uh, manufacturers of vaccine. Of vaccine. They sponsor self. They even sponsor and support a lot of uh, issues related to, to... And Pfizer is also... I think Pfizer is bringing this as well. I don't know if I'm right. But the thing is, I think with his experience, he should just make sure he empower much more health workers. Because by the time we are able to trace it, you know, we would have reduced the spread of it. I think the major thing is to make sure that we are able to trace those who have the problem and stop it from spreading. Because the more it spreads, the more we'll have much more uh, problem. I think it has increased to, is it 40 now? Yes. I, I take note of it this morning. So I think we need to do, man, I'm not sure there's casualty yet, but we need to make sure that it doesn't get uh, get spread. But we not, should not be quick to consume uh, vaccines. Vaccines. Think, yes. Well, from the lips of uh, Dr. Alius Elias reacting to the Mpox outbreak in Nigeria, let's revisit three more papers as time will permit. The first two speak to issues of the economy, particularly in the aviation sector. As earlier reported by the Punch newspaper, it's about the investments some states have placed in constructing airports over 160 billion naira, which is reported to be lining waste. As airlines have shown some states with the likes of Nasarawan Yobe leading calls on the federal government to take up ownership of this airport. For the sake of our viewing audience, let's have the Punch newspaper on screen again as we look at the headline story. The Punch had the catchphrase, Flights of Fancy, Governor slammed for wasting 160 billion naira on unviable airports. Nasarawa, Yobe, Others beg FG to take over airports shunned by airlines. Now, this is a phenomenon we've seen all through the year. I remember the report about two months ago, most persons will recall, when a number of airlines had to downsize in their fleets or into a high cost of operation. But beyond that are particular states where the rate of air travel is not as, uh, would I call it, uh, economically viable in terms of the passenger request. And now we're seeing Nasarawan Yobe asking the federal government to take up ownership of their airports. Uh, people talk about the state creation and some of the sustainabilities that are supposed to be hinged on these states being able to fend for themselves. It's also related to how industries thrive. What do you make of this development? I think it's a misplaced priority 
for all our governors to want to have airports. And it's much of personal aggrandishment. Because most of them want to have a you know, airport where they can actually fly during their rains, which is quite uh, very wrong. Most of us, when we saw uh, most of them, you know, when you see, let me give you a close example. When Nasarawa here have Abuja and they want to have the airport, when Kogi have Abuja and is also planning an airport at Ajakuta, when Ninja also have Abuja here planning airport, when a state like Anambra they have a rich state like Delta that is only a bridge. We'll be thinking of having airports in Anambra. When Delta, 30 minutes, one hour drive, is having an airport, it's a misplaced priority. You know, people, Nigerians need much more economic need that is not like creating an airport. Let me bring this to you. Do you know up to now, I can't say Nigeria have one cargo airport up to now. So most of them will claim they want to have cargo airport. And but cargo airport investment is not something small at all at all. You know? So I think by now government should stop them. Government should not take those things uh, from them. Since they are interested in having airport, they should take care of it by them. So why are they calling on federal government to come and take over now, what was their thinking when they actually started? Then every state cannot have airport. You know when you have a neighboring state who has airport go there but because of those governors because of their personal interest they want to fly on jet they want to fly from one place to the that's why they're actually creating the airport even though there's no need for those airports if we is having airport why is other ones having airport and we really seem to be if federal government uh you know take over uh, you know air, uh, the airports from them why would other states around that are very close within 30 40 minutes you'll be there why are you having airport so i think government should be careful too the federal government from take because once you take from one, I don't want to be asked you to take from one because most uh, airlines cannot go to all those routes. So to do what is it's not economically viable for them. Perhaps they will go to that state and have 20 passengers and they have a space of 200 space. And it doesn't make any sense. So if your big man actually need airport, if you need airport, you know, go to close to the one that is closer to you. I think it's a misplaced priority. And even state, state assembly should be cautioned. Because they give approval for those things. Kogi Center is also planning to expand the mini part. The part at uh, Ajakuta now. You know, you know, Niger is having it. Who is assessing it? Right? Uh, Nasawa is uh, as built one. Who is assessing it? Look at Ogun State just launched uh, its own too. You know, it's quite funny how many people... Are, in fact, it's not economic viable for those states. How can each state close 30 minutes have been having airport? It's quite funny and appalling. I think federal government need to caution them by not taking it over. Let it go moribund and let the other go. In the, I recall Gombe State also during the, the time of the former uh, governor. The man is a senator now. He would have seen that how viable are those things now. It's quite funny. Now let's tie to some of the challenges in needs assessments because people talk about white elephant projects a lot. Right. Listening to your analysis, it almost feels as though you're boxing the states into having carried out white elephant projects. Right. Now it's coming at a time when there is also increased FAC allocation but much like we saw reported most states are applying for loans to be able to sustain the economic activities and the running of government in this state now mind you we had talked about the agitation for more states to be created what would you advise states in terms of a template for self-sustainability in a bid to create employment in more viable industries right i think that the major problem is we have mediocre and that's a serious problem where the, the thing is if you have a governor who is coming and his aim is just to come and you know flag off and show himself without having a blueprint of what they want to achieve look at most of them what they campaign which is not what they're actually actually doing because when they are campaigning they'll tell you they're going to bring sukor small business will thrive will create this will create how many of them are actually are taken to that and that's why we must continue to take them accountable and now that they have increased allocation now most of them will spend it on this white elephant uh job you know elephant uh, project that doesn't really make a mini what is the uh, what is the economic impact for immediate citizen when you have airport how many people can access that airport how many people will use that airport you know if they have looked into that they will know that it's not doesn't just make any sense for you to have a neighbor that have big airport that you can always use and you each you want to have your own airport because of personal aggrandishment in terms of fact allocation there was these questions that we have more fact allocation has it translated to development in those states that's a serious question we need to ask. I can only pinpoint one state who is think this fact allocation, let me spend it on agriculture. 
and let me do more. In terms is of this government. Niger State? Niger State governor. And he actually, in fact, he calls himself farmer's governor. And he's actually children. You need to go to that state and see how he's trying to transform. Even I thought they are ravaged with uh, insecurity. But he is taking it upon himself to create that security, you know, partner the military and all the police to make sure it's actually achieved. So the fact allocation is expected to have shown in the life of people. You know, now that we have no purchasing power, you know, we want much more. You know, and we don't want it in palliative because palliative is like, uh, you know, it's, it's becoming a tool to engender more po more poverty in, in, in Nigeria now. So I think they should do more with this fact allocation. That's why we, some, some of us can verse that. Okay, federal government, why not do what is called counterpart uh, uh, funding? If you are giving them money to buy CNG buses, tell them to generate, to bring 50 uh, billion. You are bringing 50 billion. It will make them to be much more functional. But you just hand over this money to them. Well, maybe with this uh, local government autonomy, we could see different. And we are waiting for it to kick start. Now, one last uh, point before we go. It's on the any or wonder deal. Let's just quickly remind ourselves of uh, the lead story on the business day as we get Dr. Aliwa's thoughts and we wrap up the local review segment. Now, on the business day, we saw the headline future and it's question marks about the speedy approval of this deal when we have other deals like uh, the Seplat deal that's still hanging in the balance. Please, let's just get your perspective on this. Well, the OVH, I guess you are trying to talk about the yes. uh, Oando. The, the fact remains that, you know, you know, immediately President, uh, I think during President Muhammad Buhari, all Oando was was bought by NNPC. Because if you go to Oando now, it's now NNPC. Now, I was thinking, ah, okay, as a businessman, you know, you have reasons to sell and to, to buy. I think it's a proper thing for business to do. Everybody wants to make profit and you are looking at a deal. So I don't think that deal is the problem. The major problem is that the traces between pre the president family and the deal. I think that's the major uh, It's become problem. a controversy. It's become a controversy. And that's why Atiku said uh, 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 Nigeria is becoming uh, Tinubu's uh, family uh, property. I, I think it's a good one to call attention of people to it. And if it's a clear deal, no problem. If it's not clear, let them adjust. I think it's as simple as that. Now, now do you think that the speedy, let me borrow from the words that's published on the business day, PC approval of this deal, especially when the likes of uh, Mobile and Seplat is still hanging in the balance. You had said it was first announced in 2022, very correctly, so it, it's questionable. Well, the, the thing is, we have a lot of MAJA. I think FCCPC take care of uh, MAJA. So if they follow the MAJA, MAJA process and it's <laughs> approved, I don't think there's issue in that because they have been in business before now. It's not when the president became that they in business. And those things have been on pipeline over time. So I think it, 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 it depends on how transparency, and that's why we need anti-corruption agencies to look into it and FCCPC who looks into matter to look at the process if it's transparent enough. You know? Now let's talk about the NUPRC because this is the second time some Nigerians are questioning managerial decisions. It happened the first time in terms of the quality of Dangote's diesel that was debated upon but for a lab test that quelled the controversy. The NUPRC again has in most recent months come under some scrutiny about this managerial direction in terms of some handling of its affairs. What's the perception of the managerial position of the NPR, NUPRC in Nigeria's upstream sector? Right. I, I, I think um, in as much as we want Dangote to thrive, I want private sector to thrive. They should also allow the regulators to do their job. Because if you don't allow regulators to do their job, we will have uh, everything that is not supposed to be in the market. So I think they should allow them to do their job. You allow the regulatory body to actually carry their activities. They will be on the public side and not the private company. Uh, side. So I think they should, every private sector should follow the due process to give us quality uh, production at every point in time. And lastly, the only paper this morning with a front page focus on a politically driven conversation is the Matrix newspaper. The Labour Party LP, for some time now, has had quite some drama unfolding at its NWC. Now, let's look at the Matrix this morning and we call it a wrap on the local dailies. The Matrix had earlier reported that Labour Party's crisis is worsening. Let's look at some of the strap lines accompanying that headline. It says, Abure sets up disciplinary committee to deal with members who disobey him. Your tenor has ended. Conven convening NWC meeting illegal, factional leader Okafor Rose. 
INEC mischievous for saying 10 of national executives has expired, said Abure. Now, I, this Labour Party <laughs> drama, is it going away anytime soon? I think Abure is a cat with nine lives. <laughs> if, you, if you ask me, because you know, he's surviving uh, a papa led, survive NLC, and he's also coming out to even give a discipline uh, uh, warning. I, I think, uh, for me, Labour Party has performed below as expected. You know, we are now have them in National Assembly. About forty of them, you know, as of rep. Then we also have in national in the, the senator, but they have not. They are below what we expect. You not know, being a new party, a young party, you know, that have that vibrancy. We expect them to be a leading example. But I can tell you, it's quite appalling with what we are uh, we are seeing, and they should just have to get their house in properly order. ready. You know that because I was wondering when I saw Olumide Akwata, you know contesting for governor i was thinking in as much as he has expended a lot from what we are seeing and i i'm and i'm I, i'm now asking who is actually behind him is it the factional leader is it the abure you know we've not seen obi and all of them galvanizing support for him and what have you i was now thinking it may be a one-man uh, <laughs> riot that you actually want to do in a state. But be that as it may, I think we need a, a good opposition. You know, a good opposition will bring vibrancy even the current uh, administration. So we want them to get their self uh, organized and come up to really, you know, policy-driven challenges. Because I've not seen them against, you no, know, they've not spoken. I think PDP is even trying, at least from individuals like Atiku. We, we have not seen party coming out to say, okay, this is our opposition, this is what it's supposed to do. Bring an alternative solution to challenge that is uh, at hand, honestly. Well, I must thank you, Doctor, for taking our time this morning to objectively speak to the issues at hand. We appreciate you. Thank you for having me.